Well, good morning. I don't know where you are right now, but it's been cold these last few days wearing this extra vest, but the sun is out, it's warming up, and I'm sure the snow will finally get off the road. But today, we've been talking these last few weeks about building a foundation, a foundation for life, for life as people, as life as a church. And to do that, we've been building blocks for the foundation. We've talked about the Lordship of Christ, the authority of Scripture, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Last week, it was the promise of sanctification. That is, Jesus transforming us, changing us from the inside out. And today, the block that we're building for our foundation is the anchor of purpose. Purpose. It's why are we here? Why are you here listening to me? Part of a church or, or maybe not? We could even take it further is what's your purpose in life? Is it to get points with God? That's why I'm in church. Or church is where I connect with family and friends. It's my club. It's maybe it's because I've just always come to church. It's part of Sunday morning. Or, or maybe you come to church because I want to go to heaven. Or or maybe for some of you listening here who are not already part of a church, is I do. I want to find my purpose. I, I need an anchor in life, especially in this stormy times. It's just something to think about. You see, the question we need to ask this morning the question that we ask when churches, when denominations, including ours, are in turmoil, when there are so many other things that we could be doing, that we could be giving our money to, is why does church exist at all? Why are we here? Why do we do anything and everything that we do, both as a church and as individuals, as people? That's the why question that we need to be asking. Why is another way to ask the question of what's your purpose? What's our purpose? What's our purpose as a church? What's your purpose in life? Now, it's, if we have a clear purpose, a reason, it becomes an anchor for how we live our life and everything that we do. Without purpose, we have no rudder to steer the boat. We wander off course. To sail a straight course, you have to have a point out in the distance to aim at, the goal to point to. Without a purpose, we have no target to aim at. A shot will go anywhere. A shot that's not aimed can hit almost anything, even someone or something you love. Without purpose and intention, there's no reason to till the soil, to tend the garden, to fence the land, or control the weeds. Without purpose, we as human beings always take the path of least resistance, the path that seems most rewarding at the moment. And we see that happening all around us. It's how many of us end up in debt. To answer this question, we start with where we always start in these messages. We start in the scripture. Today, we start with an important declaration by the Apostle Paul. It's in the second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Now, for backing up just a little bit, in an earlier letter in 1 Corinthians, Paul had been really harsh. He called the church out on the carpet for some really awful stuff they were doing, was wild, promiscuous sex, not even the kind that the pagans wouldn't do. There was discrimination, especially amongst the rich versus the poor, uh, just overall selfishness and self-centeredness. But now, in this letter, he's writing to reconnect and rebuild his relationship with them. It may well be that now the church has swung completely from their wild days to super strict legalistic ideas of what it means to be a church. So here's what Paul wrote. He wrote, 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Lord's Spirit is, there is freedom. All of us are looking with unveiled faces at the glory of the Lord as if we were looking in a mirror. We're being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to the next degree of glory. And this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So what's Paul talking about here? He's talking about the story of Moses. See, when Moses came down from the mountain, after meeting there with God, his face shined. Now, at that time, the Old Testament, it was known and written in Scripture that you could not ever look at the face of God. It would be too much, and you would actually die. And so when Moses came down, his face, because he had been in God's presence, shined. It had to be covered, it had to be veiled, because the people were afraid. But now, now Paul tells them that the Holy Spirit in and with them lets them, lets us see God in each other as in a mirror without veils on our face. And when we come together, we see the Spirit of God in each other. That's how we are free, free to see the Spirit of God reflecting, reflected in his people. So, what about the purpose, the goal, the why? Well, let's look at this problem through the lens of the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. What are the things that we do and what are the things that we don't do? Chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. This is why we don't get discouraged given that we received this ministry in the same way that we received God's mercy. Instead, we reject secrecy and shameful actions. We don't use deception, and we don't tamper with God's word. Instead, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God by the public announcement of the truth. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are on the road to destruction. The gods of this age have blinded the minds of those who don't have faith so that they couldn't see the light of the gospel that reveals Christ's glory. Christ is the image of God. We don't preach about ourselves. Instead, we preach about Jesus. Christ as Lord, and we describe ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. God said that the light should shine out of the darkness. He is the same one who shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. These are the words of God to the people of God. So, we don't get discouraged. Why? Because we receive this ministry in the same way that we receive God's mercy. This ministry is reflecting God to each other and the world around. It was given. It was free. So instead of being discouraged, we reject secrecy and shameful action. So we don't use deception or tamper with God's word. We don't make it fit what we want it to say. Instead, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God by the public announcement of the truth. In other words, look for yourself at what God is doing in my life. Next, we don't preach about ourselves. Instead, we preach about Jesus Christ as Lord. We describe ourselves as slaves of Jesus. Jesus, I belong to you. What I think doesn't matter. It's what Jesus thinks. That's what's in this passage from 2 Corinthians. And next, we don't get discouraged. We speak truth. We don't make it fit with what we want it to say. We preach Jesus. We preach Jesus 
as the Lord. And that's pretty well packed in there in those few verses. Several don'ts, a few things to do, but it's right there where he says, we preach Jesus. What were Jesus' parting words as he was leaving to go back and to be with the Father? It's just the same as what Paul is saying here. Let's take a look at what Jesus said as they're recorded in Matthew chapter 29, verses 18 to 20. Jesus himself said, I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. So look. I myself, Jesus, will be with you every day until the end of the present age. Jesus said, go, go make disciples. He didn't say go and build a building. He didn't say go and raise money to pay for that church building. He didn't say go and have Bible studies, although all those things might well be part of making disciples. He said, go and make disciples. It's been said if you try to build a church, you will rarely get disciples. But if you make disciples, you will always get a church. So a study was done. A study was done asking why church? Why are you church? Start with the why. Why are you here in this church, in this place? Well, when that survey was given, they, they found out that 5% said they found the church on their own. Another 5 to 10% said they were invited. But 80% or more in Methodist churches said, I've always been a Methodist. I was born this way. That's their why. That's their reason. It's just always been like that. And the problem is that the longer we've been in one place, the greater the likelihood we will have forgotten the real why. And because that's what I've always done becomes the why. And we could come up with lots of things that we do in life because it's always been this way. Why do you, you cook the ham the way you always do? Why do you put that side down? Why do you use the same oil every time you change the oil in your car? There are all kinds of things like that. The stuff that we can do is the things that we've always done. We can worship well, like this morning in church. We can feed the poor. We can teach kids to read. We can raise money for the church. But when those things that we do become the reason, when we lose focus and they become the reason themselves, and it's merely that way because it's always been that way. Well, we do those things. We can do those things. And we may even, maybe we should do those things. But we've got to have underneath it a reason, a purpose. What's the end reason that we do them? Now, I might be so bold. I, I might even be off-putting. But if your reason for being in church is not to be making disciples of Jesus. If your reason for even being here online listening is to at least ask what it means to follow Jesus, well, you can be excused. But let me add, if you're listening because you want to know what this is all about, what being a disciple of Jesus Christ is about, oh, then please stay. Please stay. I mean, many of us have been part of a church for many, many years and never really thought through this why question. Thought through why church? Why this church? In a world where I'm spiritual but not religious is what we hear more often than anything. In a world where we each decide what's true for me, that decides the why question, the anchor having a purpose question, ends up being the rock bottom question that is a critical building block for our foundation, for our life as a person, for our life as a church. Why? 
What's your purpose? What's your why? Does that mean that we stop doing the things that we do? Do we stop men's Bible study groups? Do we stand, stop women's groups? Do we stop Bible studies? Do we stop the bazaar, the food pantry, the rummage sale? Do we stop even morning worship? Do we stop taking care of our buildings? Do we keep any of these things that we do? You know, if any of us actually started making a list of everything that we do, both for our homes and for our churches, we would find that it's a lot longer than you might think. Do we keep any of the things we do? Well, maybe, maybe not. But the why, our purpose, has to be the reason for doing any of what we do. You see, the question is, how does it fit with our anchor of our purpose, of our why? The question is, what's your why? What's our why together? Why is that purpose question, a goal question, purpose is our anchor. It's your anchor in storms. Now next week, next week we're going to dig into what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be hidden in Christ. We'll look at it right from the words of Jesus himself. So if you want to read ahead, we'll be studying in John chapter 15. And what difference does being a disciple an apprentice make for you? What difference does it make for me? And what difference does it make for us as a church? You've heard me quote Dallas Willard before as he describes what it means to be a disciple. He says a disciple of Jesus is a person who says to him or herself, who might even say it out loud, I want to live my life as Jesus would live my life if he were me. So when you have a clear purpose, when you have a rock bottom why, you can endure all kinds of stresses and strains. You can keep living throughout drought. You can hang on during storms. You can walk through dark valleys. You can live confidently and peacefully through quarantine and changes of life circumstances. Sure, and steady. You can plow straight roads. You can throw off what doesn't work. You can begin new practices that produce a better crop. You can learn from what others have been successful with. You can even join forces and merge acreages when it makes for better, more efficient use of land. <laughs> you know, I think that's enough metaphors of what can be driven when there is clear purpose. So what's your anchor? What's your why? What is our anchor, our purpose, as a gathering of people who follow Jesus? My reason, my why, is to be an apprentice, a disciple of Jesus, and to enable others to become disciples, to become apprentices of Jesus. May God grant us the grace and the strength to have a secure anchor and purpose in life that we would be anchored in following Jesus as Lord and Master. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these words from your, your Apostle Paul that we can have an anchor, that we can have a sure foundation, and that foundation is to follow you, to become like you, and to draw others, to teach others, to open your arm, their arms to you, and to grow your family. Thank you for the purpose that you've given us in life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, here's these, this blessing from me. May the blessings of God our Father, the fellowship that we have through the Holy Spirit, and the grace of forgiveness and salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord, guard, guide, protect, and have you walk with a clear focus and direction in life. In Jesus' name, amen.